loyal fools. Today, we do Nagash's work. Arkhan the Black has returned after centuries of fruitless searching for any clue of his master. Finally, there are omens of Nagash's imminent return. The Black Pyramid stirs, but to reveal the secrets and power within, it must be recovered before even attempting to bring the Great Necromancer back to life. This will not be an easy task, however, as many forces move against Arkham. Determined to stop any attempt at resurrecting Nagash. This is a narrative campaign set in Total War Warhammer 2. In this first episode, Ark and the Black will attempt to establish a foothold in the unforgiving deserts of Araby before uniting the remnants of the great necromancer for his inevitable resurrection. The hunt has not been in vain, and all will come to fruition soon. The land of the dead was once cultivated and populated with teeming multitudes. It is now a desolated wasteland, with ruined cities buried under the shifting sands. The landscape is a barred sea of desert, a monotonous yellow-brown, scorched by the merciless sun. Apart from a few cities still standing clinging to the coasts, these deserts are uninhabited except by a few nomad tribes, roaming hordes of greenskins or beastmen, and the numberless undead servants that are buried beneath the sands. These lands also attract adventurers and tomb robbers, but the vast majority of mortals that dare to trespass too deeply into the treacherous deserts are swallowed whole by the shifting sands, scorched under the burning gaze of the sun, or put to the sword by skeletal warriors that awake from time to time to strike down any foe that dares to enter a necropolis or gets too close to a long lost treasure. Arkan was finally back in the once great land and the time to plot the inevitable return of Nagash was now. Inside a dark chamber in the Sorcerer's Island the Lich King and his loyal Lich Priest, Berecht, discussed the course of action to take. They needed to establish a solid hold on the region. There was no time to lose, and the rituals for waking up hundreds of skeletons began in earnest. The time for war was coming. To the east of Arkan's position were the Atalan Mountains, home to the dwarves that inhabited the region. Three holds made up their core, and according to our scouts, they were in the midst of a bloody conflict with a massive war herd of beastmen that constantly battered those lands. The Blooded Axe tribe, led by a cruel leader known only as Limrender, had grown drastically over the last few months and was already laying waste to the northern dwarf settlement. The Greybeard Prospectors had a war to wage, and their homeland to defend. They would not be an obstacle, for now. What called the attention of the Lich King was the threat of a Bretonian force nearby. Honor before glory! The Knights of the Flame, as they called themselves, had traveled from far lands in a war of errantry. The Knights of the Flame were also supported by mobs of peasants. The mortal fools were too close to Arkan, and his newly established position in the land of assassins. Even worse, they dared to siege Wizard Caliph's palace, a place Arkan had secretly established as his foothold within the region, the place where their expansion would start. Apparently, his intentions were discovered by the errant knights but their interference could not be allowed. For the Bretonians, the idea of the dead walking is especially abhorrent 
to noble and commoner alike. Peasants will often bury their loved ones face down in the earth, with dried crow's feet in their mouths and cloves of garlic in their ears, apparently to stop them from rising from their graves. Maybe that was the reason the errant knights were on those lands, to eliminate the undead menace that constantly stalked their homeland. To the Lich King this mattered not. Their errantry wars would end in that damned place. After some deliberation, the course of action was decided. The knights would soon find their flame extinguished and their bones added to Arkin's forces. The board was set. As the blackness of night fell, Arkin the Black, accompanied by Lich Priest Barekt and a host of newly risen skeletal warriors, began a dark ritual within the Sorcerer's Islands. For a full moon, unearthly screams were heard, and an unnatural purple haze encircled the place. The following morning, as the sun rose, they would march towards the foolish invaders, and they would make them know their mistake. The Bretonians would know that Arkan the Black has returned. The Knights of the Flame were few in number, but the fine skills of the Mountain Knights made up for it. The small garrison of magically animated skeletal warriors defended the palace from within. The Knights, supported by a decent number of peasants, attacked the city entrances and were breaking down the defenders as time passed. They would not last much longer. If it were not for the martial skills and commanding abilities of the Tomb Prince Sarthus, surely the palace would have fallen to the Bretonians a day or two earlier. But the Tomb Prince bought enough time for the Lich King to arrive. Coming from the north, Arkan announced his arrival to the Bretonian host sending forth a single undead messenger, daring the knights to face him in open battle. The mounted warriors considered their options. Should they continue their siege, the knights would soon find themselves between the palace, still well defended by Prince Sarthas and his garrison, and the approaching Lich King's relief force. They decided to face the new menace in open fields, lifting the siege and riding north to meet the undead host. The two armies met in an open space not too far from Wizard Caliph's palace, but distance enough to prevent any significant intervention from Prince Sarthus and his forces. The Knights of the Flame saw their enemies approaching. They were eager to send the undead host back to their graves. The shifting sands of the desert moved to uncover more of the undead legions. The ranks of skeletal soldiers were bolstered by the presence of filthy crypt ghouls, awakened from their lairs during the dark ceremony that took place right before departing the Sorcerer's Islands. The ghouls were now fully committed to serve their master, unconsciously drawn to the dark magic that constantly surrounded Arkham the Black. The proud leader of the Knight of the Flame began reciting an inspiring speech and condemning the undead host approaching them. Do you know who I am? Arkin cared not. The order to attack was given in a sepulchral silence. The will of their master alone was enough to send the entire host of skeletons and crypt ghouls forward. Rank upon rank of skeletal soldiers marched animated by the souls of their former bodies. These warriors only remember the absolute loyalty they had in life and all the military drills and experience they had in the ways of war. The skeletal horde would serve Arkan without hesitation, and they were ready to fight the Bretonians in front of them. A massive tomb scorpion was awakened during the dark ceremony. It skittered menacingly along the ranks of skeletons. These monstrous beings are made of a combination of stone, fused bone, wood, and metal and they are the creations of the Mortuary Cult. Animated by dark magic, the Scorpion was now a deadly living weapon with enough power to crush any enemy in front of it. The Knights of the Flame,
pounded across the field and charged in against the ranks of skeletal infantry, eager to prove their worth and skill, and thus attain status and renown amongst their people. They had charged boldly, and their impact broke a thousand bones from the undead host. But their momentum was swiftly stopped by the overwhelming numbers of crypt ghouls supporting the skeletal hordes. The main body of peasants charged in with the intention to support their knights, and the battle turned fierce. Knights fought desperately, heedless of danger while the peasants struggled to support the noble mounted warriors. Horses' hooves flailed, shattering bones and caving skulls. But as more and more skeletons and ghouls entered the fray, the fight quickly changed to an outright slaughter. The massive scorpion charging in and attacking from beneath the sands further discouraged the valiant knights, while the crypt ghouls devoured any fleeing Bretonians without mercy. Knights, peasants, and horses alike were eaten by the ghouls without distinction. After the battle, the last of the mortals fell lifeless to the sands. But not before revealing where the rest of the Bretonian forces were located, Arkan learned that to weaken the Bretonians' position and control the entire region of the Land of Assassins, they would have to march north to the settlement of Lashik and devoid the place of all life. Within the courts of Kalis Palace, Arkan reunited with his lich priest Barakt and the tomb prince Sarthus. The bold prince received the title Defender of the Fate as a reward for his valiant defense of the palace and was given a better equipped force to command. Together they sat and discussed the next action to take. The Knights of the Flame and mobs of peasants lay dead by the hundreds, the traces of the battle quickly disappearing under the shifting sands of the tainted place. The battle for Wizard Caliph's palace was over, and it had come to a great cost for the Bretonian Knights. The Lich King had learned that even more mortal fools were in the settlement of Lashik to the north. The place was not unguarded, however, as Lorenzo Morian, an errant knight, was at the head of the defenses of the coastal settlement. When Lorenzo learned of the dire fate of his fellow knights, he knew that the rumors were true. Arkham the Black was back. Meanwhile, in the Atalan Mountains, Skullson, the veteran dwarf lord, continued his deadly war with the beastmen hordes of the Blood Axe tribe. He was forced to defend the settlements on the mountain ranges against the unrelenting enemy and Arkan was sure that for the time being, he would not interfere. And even if he did, Prince Sarthus would be ready with his forces to deal with any incursion from the Dowry. It was the right time to march north and erase the settlement of Lashik of all life. 
The Lich King awakened vast legions of skeletons and ghouls under his command. Deadly chariots made of heavy, well-protected platforms were put together. The armored carriages were covered in gilded images of skulls and bones. They were carried forward by skeletal horses that charge into battle with great speed. More constructs were put together, and Arkin bolstered his forces while dark magic flowed heavily through him. The Lich Priest Berecht oversaw the awakening of the skeletal hordes and ancient constructs. When the preparations were ready, the signal was given, and the undead host marched north. The fate of the errant knights was sealed. The skeletal warriors marched silently under the burning heat of the sun. Only the sounds of rusty bones, the bestial barks and the ghouls, and the clanking of golden armor could be heard. The legions could march for days without stopping. They did not tire, as they were fully animated by the dark magic flowing where the Lich King traveled. When Arkin and his legions were crossing the river that divided Lashik from the rest of the land of assassins, they found an enemy host many times bigger than expected. A line of mounted knights and ranks of armed peasants was completely blocking their way to the settlement. This was not as planned with the Lich King. Lorenzo must have received reinforcements from further north, or this was the main force of the Knights of the Flame. Arkin was not sure, but it made no difference. Their flesh was to be devoured and their bones would be broken and reformed into the army of the dead. Theodoric moved hastily amongst a unit of peasant bowmen. Small clouds of sand lifted as they advanced. They moved towards the undead horde. Their task was to get within firing distance from the enemy to provide missile support for the mountain knights who were also advancing nearby. Theodoric had a bad feeling in his gut. He had waged war before in the lands of Araby a few years ago. The barbarian tribes they had to face in those days were fierce. But it was nothing compared to the undead host that now moved against them. He was sure that he and every man that ran at his side would prefer to be elsewhere. But they were summoned to defend their home in Araby against this new menace. A hundred thoughts crossed his mind as he ran towards the uncertain. Suddenly, the front line stopped, and the rest of the ranks followed until the entire unit had come to a halt. With a hand gesture, the unit officer signaled his men to open fire, and Theodoric reached for his quiver. The Bretonians moved onwards, weathering a hailstorm of lethal missiles fired by skeletal hands. The undead archers fired more arrows in an unrelenting long-range attack. The knights thundered across the sands towards the bridge. Their lances brought low as they closed in on the targets. The skeletal legions and the mounted warriors clashed violently. The cavalry charge was devastating, and it sent many skeletons flying backwards. The bridge shook, and for a moment the crypt ghouls seemed confused, hesitant to engage against the seemingly unstoppable charge of the knights. But more skeleton warriors clashed against them, slowing down their charge. Shortly after, the ghouls renewed their attack and joined the fray, turning the front lines into a chaotic engagement. The best units of the Knights of the Flame were now also supported by mounted yeomen, the highest rank a peasant can aspire to. They charged with all their fury against the undead host, only to retreat briefly, regroup, and charge back again, breaking ranks and shattering bones with each heavy impact. The fight was fierce. Theodoric fired arrow after arrow into the mass of bone and twisted creatures. Screams and the clashing of weapons could be heard, 
and for the peasant bowmen supporting the knights, it was uncertain who had the upper hand in the front lines. Theodoric's face was already covered in sweat. The hot temperatures of the desert affected the living warriors in the battlefield, but not the undead ranks. The Lich King gave a chilling order, and the chariots advanced. The charioteer legions, covered by clouds of dust, thrown into the sky as they swiftly advanced. The crunching sounds could be heard as the chariots crushed bodies beneath their heavy wheels. Shortly after the initial impact, the skeletal charioteers aboard the elevated platforms began sweeping their deadly weapons towards the confused masses of the living. The battle over the stone bridge was hard. The cracking of bones, the clashes on metal, and the screams of the living could be heard by all. Down the river, the fight was no less violent. Enhanced by dark magic, the undead renewed their attacks as newly formed skeletons took the weapons of the fallen and hurled themselves against the Bretonians. Suddenly, after hours of fighting, the heat was beginning to take its real toll amongst the living. The strength of every warrior was being sapped by the punishing sun above them, and the faces of the soldiers were full with sweat, dirt, and blood. Most of them were panting from exhaustion. The river ran hot, and steam haze drowned the armies fighting along. Amongst the ongoing battle, Arkan used his dark magic to summon his new deadly creations. A unit of Ushamti emerged from the sands, standing tall between the main Bretonian line and the archers behind. Arkan watched in delight as the hulking statues of stone and gold hacked and slashed towards the backs of the main line, where the Bretonian infantry and mounted knights fought fiercely. Theodoric and his fellow bowmen panicked as they saw the carnage getting closer and closer. The valiant knights fought like beasts, and not an inch of ground was given to the undead willingly. But regardless, the dark host gained ground with each passing second. Some moments later, finally, the line broke, and the screams of agony and panic spread like wildfire across the entire Bretonian army. As the battle unfolded, Lich Priest Berecht was witness to the downfall of the living. The dark magic unleashed by both Arkan and Berecht was quickly draining the mortal fools of all life. The tomb blade of Arkan burned away the flesh of every man it touched, knight or peasant. In agony, they fell to the sands. The chariots continued to pursue the fleeing enemies and charged against the few units that still remained. At the end of the battle, hundreds of Bretonian soldiers were dead, and the hot sands were tainted with their blood. Theodoric's body ended at the bottom of a mountain of lifeless warriors. All his fellow peasant bowmen were no more. As the last cries and shouts from the fallen knights and peasants were muted forever, Arkan and Barak surveyed the battlefield. Victory was theirs, but the cost it came with had the Lich King rethinking on how to conquer the settlement of Lashik. Arkan had learned not to underestimate the Knights of the Flame, and he would not take any chance taking those walls. One thing was for sure, though. The advance of the undead legions would not be stopped.
monstrous carrions flew over the battlefield, feasting on the fallen. They would be there for three full days until all traces of the battle were covered in sand or eaten away. Through dark magic, Arkan binded many of those repulsive scavengers to his own will. The razor-sharp beaks and hooked talons would serve him well against the Knights of the Flame and any other foe that stood against him. Arkan learned not to underestimate the Bretonians in those arid lands. Victory was achieved that day, but at a higher cost than initially expected. He would not spare any chances when taking Lashik. As the night fell, the Lich King and a host of Lich Priests, headed by Barekt, chanted and enacted dark rituals to reanimate and bind the skeletal forms of the Fallen. Hundreds and hundreds of reanimated warriors rose from the sands and took arms as they moved to form into perfectly arranged ranks, all moving in unison to Arkan's will. There was one particular hooded figure that rose from the sands. Prince Oharan the Exalted was given a special task. He would ride first to the settlement in an attempt to sabotage the walls and bring havoc to the living men that garrisoned Lashik. Arkan's will was to weaken the defenses before the main assault. Riding an undead steed and covered in an unnatural black shroud, Prince Oharan rode forth. In addition, the Lich King ordered the revival of a new Tomb King under his command. The awakening of King Ahab the Graceful was heralded by the arrival of new constructs and thousands of undead legions that served the Graceful Ruler in life thousands of years ago. King Ahab was given the honor to march alongside Arkan to take part in the Siege of Lashik. Two massive armies would make the assault on the walled settlement. Prince Sarthus would still remain within Wizard Kalif's palace, to guard it against any invasion from the dwarfs, the lizardmen, or any roaming horde. After a full night of unnatural rites accompanied by purple clouds across the sky, the skeletal army was once again ready to march past the river, and finally against the walled settlement. The Bretonians sounded their horns and readied their defenses as they watched, terrified over the walls. A vast undead host covered the horizon, and their approach was implacable. Countless skeletal legions marched towards them. Lorenzo Morian, the Lord of the Knights of the Flame, was surprised that Arkan had replenished his ranks so fast. He had barely managed to escape the carnage that had just happened, and some of his wounds were still in bad state. He quickly made count for the situation. The settlement was well garrisoned, but against the seemingly countless unnatural legions, it would not hold out for long. They had spent the majority of their forces in the battle over the bridge, and the majority of the few survivors were wounded. There were no further words of reinforcements coming their way. Even worse, there were increasing reports of sickness among the ranks. Apparently, the main well of the settlement had been poisoned. They were surrounded but they would fight for their lives until the end. Massive siege towers made of bones and gold, sustained by magic, crashed against the walls and the doors opened. Hundreds of crypt ghouls jumped over the ramps and a fierce fighting over the walls began. They hacked and slashed violently against the defenders, who fought back with no less determination for they knew there was no turning back from this fight. Just below, a terrifying battering ram slammed against the settlement's main gate. Each hit cracked the entrance, and the crunching sound lowered the morale of the defenders inside. Lorenzo ran back and forth, despite his wounded state, doing his best effort to boost the morale of his men. But the sound of the massive door progressively falling apart turned his guts into ice. Soon enough, ladders were mounted and placed against the walls. Thousands of skeletons climbed to aid in taking the walls. 
The defenders were being overwhelmed, but they held strong. They knew that to lose the walls was to lose the fight, and therefore their lives, and those of the ones who were hiding deeper inside the settlement. Screams and shouts were heard all over the walls, when suddenly, a massive blast was heard by everyone. The battering ram had finally shattered the main gates, and that was when the real carnage began. A unit of hulking Ushabti made its way into the settlement first, tearing apart all who dared to stand before them. Hundreds of undead warriors followed, bolstered by the dark spells of Ark and the Black. Berekt, the powerful Lich Priest, rearranged the bones of the fallen into newly animated warriors that marched once again to return to the fight. The Bretonians fought with all their might, bringing down skeletons by the dozens, but every time they rose up again, ready to fight like new. In a desperate attempt to gain some hope for his fellow knights, Lorenzo challenged Arkin to a one-on-one -on -one duel. The Lich King accepted, and the valiant knight charged forward. With a gesture from his hand and a cursed sword, Arkin made Lorenzo's horse fall to the ground to never move again. The Lich King made short work of the knight by sapping his energy with a spell, making him fall lifeless to the sands. Soon the defenders realized they had no chance, and many of them began running away, looking for a hiding place, or rushing to find an escape, while thousands of skeletons continued to pour in from the broken gates. For hours, the screaming continued inside the settlement of Lashik. No one was to be spared. After the battle, the Knights of the Flame were no more, and they had met their fitting end. The mortal fools would now march under Arkin's command to aid him in his quest to resurrect Nagash. The fate of Lashik would serve as a dire warning to all Bretonians in the region. With the taking of the settlement, the entire region of the Land of Assassins was now in the Lich King's possession. It was time for the next phase of the plan. With the entire region of the Land of Assassins finally under the Lich King's control, Arkin began preparations for the next phase of his plan to expand further into the lands of Araby and eliminate all the errant Bretonian knights. With a solid presence in the region and more power to negotiate, a secret meeting was convened with the ravenous beastmen that had a menacing presence in those arid lands. A non-aggression pact was agreed between the undead legions of Arkan and the beastmen warherds. It is not clear what the Lich King negotiated exactly with the Beast Lord, or how he managed to convince the Dark Forces to come to a truce, but when the meeting ended, a temporary unholy alliance was formed, and both parties were seemingly satisfied with the terms. Before Arkin could make any further moves towards the Black Pyramid or any other target, he had one unexpected menace waiting for him. Cloaked in shadows, and well hidden, the paladin Henry the Massive managed to survive the onslaught on Lashik, and was set on one clear goal, to
to kill Arkham the Black at all costs. Even if it required sacrificing his own life, Henry Lamassif was a valiant Bretonian. From a young age, he was trained and raised as an honorable man. One day, his village was attacked by twisted beasts emerging from a dark forest nearby. Many died on that fateful night, but many more would have lost their lives if it were not for the efforts of Henry, who fought against the beasts like a blessed knight. At the end, they had to retreat and Henry was taken away by friendly hands, wounded but fighting until the very last moment. For his sheer act of heroism, he became renowned across the fair lands and continued training to become one of the Chevaliers of Leoness and eventually the most trusted paladin of Réponse de Leoness, or the Damoiselle de Guerre, as she is known throughout Bretonia. Henry Le Massif knew Arkin had set his sights on Réponse and he would do anything to stop the Lich King from moving against her. Right when the opportunity presented itself, the valiant paladin broke his disguise and lunged himself against the Lich King. But he was a fraction of a second too slow. Prince Aharon the Exalted intervened and managed to stop the assassination attempt. The skeletal priest quickly immobilized the surprised attacker and Henry Lamassif was mortally wounded. Your servant's head will be returned on a spike! <laughs> With a sharp poisonous blade, Aharon sapped his energies to a shell, and with some twisted interrogation methods, he attempted to break the Bretonian. With his last breath, Henry mocked the petty skeleton prince. He would not reveal any information to the Dark Host, so passed away Henry Le Massif, with his quest unfulfilled, but with his loyalty and honor unbroken. Although any information about their enemy would always be useful, the fact that the paladin didn't reveal any didn't bother Arkin. He had collected enough clues already to decide on his next course of action. The Lich King gave Prince Aharon his next mission. He would ride north with the target in sight, Réponse de Leoness. Réponse is the Duchess of Leoness. She earned her reputation by her valiant actions when defending the city of Curon, when it was besieged by the Chaos Lord Karan the Blighted. In the darkest of hours, the damsel had a vision of the Lady of the Lake. She knew she had to defend the city, and after the manifestation, she bravely set off to battle the Chaos Host by grabbing an ancient sword and standing defiant against the enemy, inspiring many of the already fleeing knights to fight alongside her. When the Chaos Lord was face to face against the damsel, he raised his great sword above his grimacing visage, but he was momentarily dazzled by Rapunzel's new radiant aura. In that moment, she beheaded him with a single sword stroke. Curon was saved, and the fleeing enemy were pursued to the sea and swiftly put down. From that day, her sword and armor glowed with the brilliant light of divine intervention. Her eyes shone with terrible judgment, and her voice cried forth damnation upon her enemies. The growing menace of the Lich King and his Dark Host needed to be taken care of immediately. Rapunzel sent word to her Bretonian allies along the coast of Araby. She requested their support to fight Arkham the Black and deal with the undead threat once and for all. Soon she received some dire news. Her Bretonian allies were not able to help, due to them being in the middle of a fierce struggle against the Beastmen herds that were suddenly attacking en masse, plundering and running rampant in their territories. They were using all their available resources and manpower to contain them. Rapunzel and her knights were alone in their war against the Lich King. Despite this, the Bretonians were not ones to back out from a fight, and they made their own preparations in anticipation of the inevitable bloodshed to come. 
Not all news was bad, however, as a small expedition of Chevaliers de Leoness received the damsel's message and were making their way south to reinforce their main army. Prince Aharon, the Exalted, successfully reached Rapunzel's army. They were well defended inside the settlement of Koffer, but the prince was set on killing the renowned knight. He infiltrated the crowded place, moving from cover to cover, and blending himself amongst the people, and disappearing before anyone could notice any suspicious activity. The place was busy with vibrant movement. Some carried weapons and war equipment from one place to another, while others constructed barricades, reinforced the gates, and shut doors and windows. Despite his best efforts, the deadly skeletal agent failed to kill or wound the damsel of war, as she was well protected at all times. But Aharon did not return empty-handed. He gathered enough information to know that the Chevaliers of Leoness were planning to ride out of the settlement of Koffer shortly. The exact reason for their movement was still unknown to the undead prince, but this information was all he needed for now. With this valuable knowledge, the Dark Host made their move. Shrouded in dark energies, the powerful Lich Priest Berecht channeled the winds of magic to trigger a sandstorm. Initially, it began manifesting as heavy clouds of dust that devoured everything in their path with a thin veil of sand. But quickly it morphed into wild gusts of wind, forming deadly tornadoes that took shape and dissolved with unnatural speed and ferocity. The heavy storm began to move slowly to the north, towards the settlement of Koffer. Every citizen in the Bretonian hold watched in horror at the approaching sandstorm. Now made of black and purple clouds, the unnatural winds formed strange faces that lasted an instant before diffusing themselves into the clouds. Heavy thunder, accompanied by purple flashes, announced the imminent arrival of the Dark Host. But as the sandstorm got closer and closer to the settlement, the clouds began dispersing and settling. An intense bright light irradiated from the city center, where Ponce and her court prophetess were gathered there. They prayed to the Lady of the Lake, and she was answering with her divine blessings. It seemed that the dark energies could not enter the settlements while the lady's protection was with them. After an entire day of struggling, Berecht stopped his dark ritual, unable to overpower Rapanz and her prophetess in their battle of wills. The dark clouds finally dissipated, and the way was clear. When the dust settled, an entire army of skeletons was found dangerously close to Koffer. It was the army of Sarthus, the Defender of the Fate. Imbued with dark energies and counting with a menacing number of skeletal units at his disposal, it posed a serious threat to Rapunzel and her knights, if not dealt with immediately. Sarthus's army was killing every living being in their path, and with them, treasures were taken, trade routes were compromised, and innocent lives were lost. Many skirmishes were fought to halt the sudden advance of Prince Sarthus in the region, but his forces were too numerous, and the Bretonian pockets of resistance were taken mostly by surprise. They needed to be taken care of with the blunt force of a proper army of knights. Rapunce didn't know the location of Arkin's main army, as it was nowhere to be found, but there was no time to locate it. Before Prince Sarthus's undead legions made their next move, so it was that the damsel of war chose to ride out and fight against Sarthus and deal with that immediate menace before refocusing on the Lich King. Both armies met in an oasis located just a few miles south of the settlement. When Rapunzel and her knights arrived, they were being expected by Sarthus, who had hidden some units in the nearby rock formations and vegetation. When the armies clashed, the superiority of the Chevaliers of Leoness was quickly noted. Rapunzel moved from one formation to another, issuing orders and fighting with sheer determination. 
an aura of light and protection, surrounded the mighty Duchess of Leoness. Skeletons fell by the dozens, but more and more emerged from different points and began surrounding the Bretonians. Warriors of Leoness, behold! Even here, the lady watches over the brave and the righteous. The signs are clear. Just as in Koron, when we rode forth to vanquish the evil that threatened to overcome it, we must do so again. The lady compels us to lend our hands to this noble fight. Chevaliers, charge! The skeletons surrounding the knights were many, but their attacks proved to be ineffective against the heavily protected mounted warriors and the organized mobs of men-at-arms supporting them, all inspired by the presence of her punts. Sarthus ran against the Blessed Knight to challenge her in a duel. Fighting with all their might, Prince Sarthus and Repance battled fiercely, swinging their weapons against each other. The Damsel of War was a highly skilled warrior, and it showed. Slowly but surely, the Dark Prince was breaking apart against her might. In the middle of the battle, Skeletal hands began suddenly arising from the sands, coming up from seemingly everywhere. New enemies emerged to immediately attack the Bretonians. Before the knights could fully realize what was going on, a frightening horn sounded atop a nearby hill. Vast legions of even more skeletal warriors advanced in formation. Crypt ghouls and chariots covered ground quickly in their unrelenting advance all rolling down against the Bretonian army. Arkan the Black, accompanied by Berect, watched as their army pushed forth to crush the knights fighting ahead. How the Lich King had managed to hide himself and a full army of skeletons was beyond comprehension. But in that moment of terror, Rapanz realized they had been ambushed. Using the cover of the dark sandstorm, Arkan had buried himself and his legions in the nearby dunes, to emerge when the time was right. Using Sarthus as bait, Arkin would strike when the knights were already winded by the fierce fight. Filled with dread, the men-at-arms supporting the knights glimpsed at each other, not knowing what to do. They looked upon their leader, searching for direction against the growing panic and chaos. Riponce knew that they had been surrounded but she wouldn't show any signs of despair. Instead, she rode forth to confront the newly arrived enemy head-on, leaving Prince Sarthus behind, badly wounded, but not finished. Hear me, brothers! The foul, undead kings of these lands want to see the world bow to the dark shroud of their rule. This greatly offends the lady. I may have been born a peasant, but it has been my life's purpose to ensure that men of the righteous and good triumph over evil in all forms. I fear no evil, for I am guided by the Lady's divine will. She watches over me and shows me the way, just as my faith in her guides me and gives me strength. Have faith in me, and I shall do the same for you. To battle, Chevaliers! In the middle of the battlefield, Arkan the Black fought against Rapunzel de Leoness. The Damsel of War fought with all her might, blessed with a halo of light that inspired all Bretonians around her. But the Lich King was imbued with dark energies that seemed to burn and consume the air itself. Against the overwhelming numbers of skeletons and ghouls, the Bretonians began to falter, and some of them began to flee for their lives seeking to retreat to Koffer and get behind the safety of the walls. Rapunz knew they couldn't fight against two armies, and fought to gain time for some of the knights to retreat. As she fought with her dwindling energies, she prayed to the Lady for deliverance, for the power and strength to at least hold the dark armies back enough to save her fellow knights and peasants. But she was at the Lich King's hands, and the odds were overwhelming. The Bretonians saw in horror as Rapunz was consumed in a mob of darkness and death as the damsel of war fell to the sands. 
lifeless. From there, the remaining Bretonians were swiftly cut down, while only a few managed to escape the devastating ambush. In the meantime, the Tomb King Ahab, the Graceful, had intercepted the small force of remaining Chevaliers de Lyonnais that were making their way to reinforce Rapunce. The army of Bretonians was now cornered against the coast. The Tomb King's army was vast, and the living warriors knew they had no chance against such odds. To make matters worse, the army of undead was reinforced by massive carrions and unnatural bats that darken the skies and attack them with their deadly talons. The cornered army fought valiantly even holding on to the slight hope that Rapunce would help them, but to no avail. They were swiftly put to the sword, and the beach was tainted with blood. Before the sun set that day, Ahab was standing atop the lifeless bodies of many of Bretonia's finest knights. Arkan the Black, having sustained minor damage against Rapunzel's main army, set to immediately siege the nearby settlement of Coffer. Now, Without the protection of Rapunce, they would surely fall in no time. With hundreds of skeletal warriors at their disposal, and aided by their dark magic spells, Arkin and Berect raised massive siege towers to take on the settlements. Their walls were tall, but they wouldn't stop the Lich King. The doom of the Bretonians was inevitable. Guillaume Beaumont was the knight in charge of the defenses on Coffer. The Bretonians had prepared as much as they could, but now the Lich King was at the gates, and the time to fight was now. The odds seemed overwhelming, but Guillaume had one clear mission in mind, to take out the head of the snake. Only by cutting the source of dark power could the rest of the legions crumble to dust. The siege began, and the fight for the walls quickly turned fierce. The defenders fought for their lives, knowing what had happened to their fellow errant knights and their wars against the Lich King. If they lost against the undead, they would all surely face the same fate as the settlement of Lashik and all the other victims the Dark Host had claimed. During the battle, Berect, the most loyal of the Lich King's advisors, was killed by Guillaume Beaumont. The knight had seized a moment of opportunity to attack him directly, quickly breaking down the ancient bones of the Lich Priest. Infuriated by the loss of his right hand up until that moment, Arkin worded a dark incantation and killed Guillaume leeching his spirit with deadly magic, leaving his lifeless body to fall to the ground. When his fellow knights and peasants saw this, they were disheartened. The massive tomb scorpion, now famed as Lashik's Lament by the Bretonians of the region due to its deadly performances against the Knights of the Flame, caused devastating havoc and panic within the settlements. Dozens of Bretonians perished under its massive hulk as they failed to wound the imposing construct, which moved with surprising speed. 
The streets were quickly overrun by the hundreds and hundreds of ghouls and skeletons flooding the place. Soon enough, the Chevaliers de Lyonnais were no more. It was a tragic day for the knights errant in the region, and for all of the Bretonians. A blow that would forever mark the history of both races, and that would blemish with bad blood the sands of Araby for years to come. In the aftermath, the armies of Prince Sarthus, the Defender of the Fate, and Tomb King Ahab the Graceful, rallied with Ark in the Black. Berecht was no more. But Bakari, another powerful lich priest, rose in his place. No setback would put a halt to Arkan's advance. The knights were taken care of. The armies of the Lich King were ready to march east towards the Black Pyramid of Nagash. The day when Arkan finally succeeds in resurrecting his Dark Master grows closer and closer. And on that day, the Tomb King shall be destroyed, and the world shall drown in death. Hello my friends, it's Choyer here. I hope you enjoyed this narrative campaign focusing on Archon the Black. In this second part of the video, I want to give you an afterword on the campaign itself and talk about how this series came to be, uh, what I learned from it, and what I think could be improved upon, and so on. It is important to mention that the campaign had to come to a halt a little bit earlier than I expected. I'll tell you why in a moment as we talk about the different things that happened, what was learned in the process and what we could try to incorporate for the next one. Let's begin with the origins of the narrative campaign and the main idea behind it. So whenever I play almost any strategy game, I always come up with these mini stories in my head based around whatever is happening in the game. Uh, for me, a battle is way more enjoyable when you know why the armies on the battlefield are fighting, what's at stake, which are the characters driving the story or the battle forward, is there a rivalry between the two races or, or between two or more particular characters. Knowing the answers to these questions really make for a more enjoyable experience rather than just pitching two armies against one another for no apparent reason and see who wins. Now, there are many who enjoy the competitive aspect of a Total War or Warhammer game, always trying to outplay their opponent, making the perfect build to get the upper hand and all that, and that's awesome, that's another way of getting enjoyment out of the game, and I can totally see why, I can see the appeal in that approach, but in my case it's just not my cup of tea. I've always been a player that inclines more towards the narrative side of things. If something happens in my campaign or in a multiplayer match that makes me lose a battle but it makes for a good story, then I'm happy with it. That's, at that, that's the kind of enjoyment I look for in this type of games. So when playing a Total War or a Warhammer game, that's what I try to look for. And the main goal for this particular narrative campaign was to give that point of view, that uh, narrative side or story-driven playthrough of a Mortal Empires campaign. One of the most important aspects that the campaign needed to get right was to give the viewer that context, that uh, situational awareness that would allow him to grasp the entire situation as it evolved in-game. I think in that department we got it right. Initially we drafted three map options and then shared them to our patrons who gave, them, who gave their own feedback and we chose the one that got featured in the final series. Putting the map, the characters, the settlements and the moving pieces together was a bit of a challenge but it turned out to be quite useful in giving that overview of the entire situation and the challenges that Arkan the Black was facing from a good point of view. With that done, the next challenge was trying to come up with a time frame in which to set the story on. As far as I know, every turn in Total War Warhammer does not have a fixed time frame in which you can say X amount of days or years have passed uh, going from one turn to the next, so establishing fixed dates for particular events was out, was out of the question. Instead, terms like shortly after or in the wake of X event were used. 
Now, like I said before, the main idea of the narrative campaign was trying to make the in-game events into narrative stories that gave life to the playthrough. For example, during the campaign there was an instance where an agent of the Knights of the Flame attempted to kill Arkhan the Black inside a settlement. In the game, this is a simple action that can result in either a positive or negative outcome. That's it, and then you move on. But in the narrative campaign series, I tried to add a bit of a backstory to it uh, to give that agent a reason to kill Arkhan and how Arkhan in the end managed to avoid that attempt. Uh, just to give the campaign that extra flavor, that extra uniqueness. On the other hand, uh, and at the same time, this hindered the pace of the entire campaign. If you look back into the series, you will see that Arkhan the Black managed to secure the entire region of the Land of Assassins, but when you compare that to the overall size of the Mortal Empires map, you will see that that's only a fraction of what's available out there for the taking. So when thinking about it, I'll say that we did a good job in covering battles, agent actions and other particularities, but at the same time the story moved on very slowly because of this. And sometime during the making of this campaign, the latest Total War Warhammer 2 DLC came out. It was the one with Eltharion the Grim and Chrome the Punch. So in order to cover that release and make a lore video around that DLC, I had to update the game and this resulted in me having to put a halt to work on the black. For the next narrative campaign, I'd love to find a way to speed up the pace and move the story forward quicker in order to cover more ground. The main challenge would be then to know which events to cover and go more in depth and which ones will be just ignored because they wouldn't have much of an impact in the overall story. Moving on to characters, Arkhan the Black was of course the main character in the series, but there were others that took the spotlight too. In the second episode there was a battle in an open space where we saw Theodoric fight and die there. Theodoric was a peasant bowman, fighting with the Bretonians and trying to stop the advance of the Lich King. We are generally used to seeing a story from the main character's point of view, but one thing I really enjoy from the Warhammer fantasy or even Warhammer 40k novels is that they often get into the shoes of regular soldiers and warriors that are in the front lines and you can actually see and feel the world through them. With Theodoric, I tried to bring the battle to life by describing what this particular peasant was feeling, what was it like to fight the undead host under the burning gaze of the sun. Another example is the lich priest Berect. He was the main advisor to Ark and the Black throughout the entire campaign, and there are a lot of mentions of him during the series. In the last episode, he died during a siege against the Chevaliers the Lioness, and this enraged Arkhan, who immediately attacked the one responsible for his death. Other examples are the Lord's race to command the armies of the undead host, Prince Sarthos or the Tomb King Ahab the Graceful. I'd love to point out that one of the main challenges for me moving on to the next narrative campaign will be to involve the community more. For this campaign, I was planning on naming cities and characters based on what patrons suggested, make strategic decisions during the campaign and other things that can be done. Some things were implemented and some others were not. And I know it's up to me to make those things happen, I need to step up in that aspect. So looking back into the whole thing, I feel I got a few things right and I got some others that I need to work on. So I'm interested in your own feedback, I know many of you enjoyed the series and I'm very happy knowing that it really motivates me to create the best Warhammer content I can but I know there are always things to improve. What do you think can be done better for the next narrative campaign? What factions and topics could we explore? Please let me know in the comments. I hope you have enjoyed this video and see you soon my friends. On this channel we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.